Good afternoon, volleyball fans. This is your boy, Taron Rodriguez, coming at you with yet another episode of Set Point here on iSports Radio. It's a beautiful Wednesday afternoon. You're probably wondering, hmm, why isn't it Monday? Well, let's just say I ran into some problems on Monday, and unfortunately I had to put off, put off Set Point that day. But now I'm here, ready to talk some NCAA Volleyball. Hopefully I can get this jammed pack into less than an hour, because I've got stuff to do, but that's none of your, everyone's business. So we've got a lot to talk about, starting off with the key matchups from last week. There were a lot of interesting matchups and a few unexpected results. And we're going to be talking about today's matchups, today's key matchups for for today, for Wednesday. So yeah, pull up the seat, kick back, relax, and let's get down and enjoy some volleyball action. So first, so first and foremost, thank you to everyone that's tuning in, whether you're tuning in on Spreaker or any other platform. Because without you, the fans, none of this would be possible. Gotta give you a round of applause. Alright, now let's get into some of the key matchups that happened last year. First off was Baylor versus Iowa State. Now this matchup was pretty unique because... It was not only a Big Ten, Big Twelve conference matchup, but it was also the tw- the forty ninth meeting between Baylor and Iowa State. The series was tied twenty four to twenty four, but only one would notch the twenty fifth win, and that team was Baylor that notched the twenty fifth win in the series as Baylor swept away Iowa State, swept them quite easily, to be honest with you. And and, and but that that's not really that. That's surprising, considering you know Baylor's the number one, number one team in the nation. You know that much you need to know about. However, their their match against Iowa State, who is unranked, was a bit of a tough one. You know, the first set was twenty six twenty four. Second set, Baylor had a little bit of an easier time, w- winning set to twenty five eighteen, and then the third set was twenty seven twenty five. So. And in the match, Baylor hit only, they only hit 214, which is kind of good, you know. They struggle hitting in sets one and two, despite win, despite winning set two by a comfortable margin. Iowa State hit 147, kind of expected considering, you know, they, they kind of lost in straight sets. You know, the second set, they hit negative 32, which is, it's, you know, you know, seven kills on eight hitting errors, that's... That's not going to get the job done, and that's going to make you have a bad hitting percentage. Dig-wise, Baylor outdug Iowa State 63-54, to but block-wise, Iowa State outblocked them 8-5, to which is pretty impressive. The kill leaders for for Baylor were Yasania Presley, who had 15 kills. She's continuing to get the job done. Shelly Stafford had 10 kills, and Gia Milana had 8 kills. For Iowa State, Annie Hatch had 10 kills, Avery Rhodes had 9 kills, and then Eleanor Holthaus Holt, Holt had 6 kills. Ace-wise, Iowa State won the ace battle 3-2, to two, but that, that, that it's not that big of a margin. That wasn't too groundbreaking. Assist-wise, Hannah Lockin had 34 assists for Baylor, Tara Wolf had 5 assists, and then... Brea Hunt had three assists. Assist-wise for Iowa State, Piper Mock had 33 assists, and then Eleanor Holthaus had two assists, and that's about it. Dig-wise was the was very interesting. Both both teams had uh, three triple-digit triple-digit dig leaders. Hannah Locken had 15 digs. Tara Wolf had 13 digs, and then Brea Hunt had. 11 digs. So, Hannah had a double-double on the night, uh, which was very impressive. And then Taro was kind of flirting with the double-double, which is pretty good. And then dig-wise for Iowa State, 
Mikal Schuler had 15 digs, Izzy Enna had 14 digs, and then Eleanor Holthaus had 10 digs. You know, solid night, solid night. You know, six, six kills, six kills, two assists, and 10 digs. Very impressive. But Baylor, you know, they're number one in the nation as of as of this week. For those of you that didn't tune into that didn't turn, tune into the defining moment, I did read off the the rankings of this week. Let's go over those rankings as as I pull them up. Thanks to the NC thanks to the NCAA.com where I'm getting my where I'm getting my source. 25 through 21, Missouri, Western Kentucky, Louisville, Hawaii, Washington State. 20 through 16, Purdue, Rice, Utah, Illinois, and Kentucky. 15 through 11, Cal, Cal Colorado State, Florida, Marquette, Creighton. 10 through 6, Washington, BYU, Penn State, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And then 5 through 1, Nebraska, Texas, Pitt. Stanford and Baylor. Baylor still holding on to that number one spot. They are a perfect 15 and 0 going into this week, which is very, which once again they are having an amazing season. Tonight they, or no, Saturday they take on Texas Tech, but next Wednesday they play Texas. I'll probably talk about that next week. But as for their Saturday match against Texas Tech, if it would be very wise to not. It would be very, very, very wise for Baylor to not look ahead to that Texas matchup, considering they have to get the job done on on Saturday. Otherwise, that they they might be behind the eight ball for sure. So, so we'll see what happens. I pretty much expect Baylor to to win that one quite easily. Texas Tech, however, is no slouch. They are three and two in conference. And uh, they are 13 and six overall, so, and they're and w which is very impressive if you ask me. Tonight they play Kansas, so they've got two games this week. Kansas at home, but Baylor's going to have a pretty a pretty easy time beating beating Texas Tech, considering it is a home game for for Baylor. And I, I don't I really don't see them dropping this one I, again as long as Baylor doesn't look ahead. They can definitely win, win against Texas Tech, honestly. And but the big question is, can Baylor make a bit of a a, a deep run into the NCAA turn in the NCAA tournament? That remains to be seen, considering their conference doesn't really have too many notables, notable matchups. You know, other than Texas, you know, they still have Oklahoma, which is up there. T TCU was TCU is kind of up there. TCU actually pushed a Baylor to to the brink. They, they it Baylor did win sweep Tex, TCU, Texas Christian University, but the third set between Baylor and TCU, that set was won 34 to 32 by the Bears. So, the Horn Frogs are definitely doing something good against Baylor. So, Baylor needs to realize they're not the invincible team and they're certainly not not, they're not like the favorite to win it all yet, but you know if they keep if they keep up their consistency and they just don't overlook any opponents and you know if you, you if you Sonia you Sonia Presley continues to do her thing, you know she she's hitting I believe she's hitting over three hundred, which is just straight up amazing. So if you Sonia Presley continues to do her thing for Baylor. Not not many teams are gonna stop are gonna have a whole lot of success against the Bears, but you know Baylor winning that matchup was definitely impressive, so so that's definitely a good thing. So so that's that mat that's key matchup number one. Key matchup number two was number three Creighton going on the road and upsetting number ten Marquette. Winning in five sets, which was definitely impressive. Definitely one of the more notable upsets of the week last week. Got to hit the applause button right there. So yeah, definitely Creighton pulled off a big win for... Big win over... Over Marquette. 
you know, you know, that's definitely a big win, uh, a big conference win at that. That puts Creighton's record at 13 and three. And as I said in the rankings, Creighton is now number 11 this week, while Marquette slips behind them one, a couple spots. So Marquette is number 12, and that's 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 impressive. That's impressive. That's impressive. And I'm. And uh, Creighton, Creighton's definitely one of those under the radar teams. I think they're definitely a threat to ser- some teams. You know, you know, in the in the match against in the match against uh, Marquette, they hit two seventy four, which is very impressive. While while holding Marquette to only a hit, hitting percentage of two seventeen, which is decent, you know, but two out of those those five sets Marquette hit under 100, which is, is not really impressive. You know, look at the, the, uh, set scores, you know, Creighton was actually up to nothing. They won the first two sets, 25, 21, 25, 23. And then Marquette, you know, they had to grind it out in sets three and four winning set three, 29, 27, and then 31, 29. But then they kind of run out, ran out of gas and Marquette just, and then Creighton just took over and just rolled past Marquette and set five, fifteen, eight. You know, Marquette only had five kills that that set, and then they had three errors, which means, which explains the 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 a point eighty seven hitting percentage. Creighton had zero hitting errors and twelve kills in that but fifth set. Twelve kills and zero hitting errors. That is very impressive. Because to a set to 15 means that you're not going to have too many kills. You're probably going to have... You'll probably get some kills, but I didn't expect 12 kills. That's basic... That's basically four-fifths of of the set right there. That's basically four-fifths of your points right there. So that definitely deserves the applause button right there. All right, so De- so Marquette is now six and zero in conference play, while Marquette is five and one. So statistic wise, you know, th- you know, obviously Creighton outkilled Marquette seventy six to sixty six. Ace wise, they Creighton out kill out aced uh, Marquette six to five. Lock wise, Creighton had fourteen, while Marquette had eleven. Dig wise was very tight. They had 85 digs as opposed to 82 digs for Marquette. And as for the kill leaders, Keely Davis. Keely Davis had 31 kills. 31 in one match. That's one behind the the team record. So that's very impressive right there. That that that's definitely Madden numbers right there. You know, Madden numbers as Larry B and I calls it. You know, shout out to Larry B. Doing his thing, you know, do, Host a lot of shows. He'll be hosting the define or not the defining moment, the three and out uh, primetime matchups after this show. So yeah, I see you, Larry B. So anyway, Keely Davis, thirty one kills. That's very impressive. Erica Kostalek had nineteen kills, and then Jayla Zimmerman had twelve kills. Dig wise, Brittany Witt had thirty five digs. Madeline Cole had fourteen digs. And Emily Bressman had 10 digs. This wise, Madeline Cole had 63 assists, and then Brittany Witt had five assists. Good to see uh, Madeline Cole getting a double double. It's very impressive, you know. It, it's common for most setters, but considering they're they're bound to have at least 10 10 they're bound to have have at least 10 assists in a match. It's very rare to see them having less than 10 assists unless you're running a 6-2, which means you're running two setters either on the same floor or you're just rotating two setters. Anyway, for Marquette, Allie Barber had 23 kills, while Hope Orch and Madeline Mo- Mosier, Mosier, Mosher, each had 11 kills. Digwise, Martha Konov- Konovadoff had 24 digs. Lawrence Speckman had 14 digs. And Sarah Rose had 10, 10 digs as well. Blockwise, Elizabeth Orff had seven blocks. Gwen Jones had four blocks. And then Hannah Vandenberg had three blocks. I forgot the, to mention the block leaders for Creighton. 
Naomi Hickman had 11 blocks. She was definitely roofing everyone, so she may as well just have her own roofing company. Huh? <laughs> yes. Yes, she, she definitely should have her own roofing company, honestly. Anyway, Jayla Zimmerman had flat five blocks, and then Erica Kostalek had four had four blocks as well. Had four blocks, so that's definitely a big win for Creighton because because that's also their eighth straight victory, and that's a huge win. The Big East, you know, they have the ins the inside track for first place in the Big East. You know, I, but I could see that matchup being the rematch being a very, very big one. Honestly, it's it's going to be a an intense rematch the second time around. I definitely can see Marquette possibly taking it to Creighton on the road, but Creighton is a very solid team. Creighton has had some really solid wins. You know, currently they're six and zero in Big East play, and they've you know while they have some notable losses to like. To like Washington, who was number twelve at the time, they do have some solid wins over USC, number twelve Kentucky. They did get swept by number three or number twenty Baylor and number two Nebraska, and they did have a little bit of a hiccup against Iowa State. But then they started to pick it up. You know, they've won eight. Like I said, they've won eight straight. They start off zero and three. Then they got it. They got the ball rolling, and then they kind of had another hiccup again. And like I said, they had another hiccup against Washington. But ever since that Washington loss, they kind of flipped the switch. So, so their next game is Friday against Butler, which is their alumni night. And they also have a game Sunday against Xavier. And they and the next week they have two back-to-back -back games against Providence. Should be good. Should be good. Should be good. So, and then for those of you that don't know, the Big East has a conference tournament at the end of toward the end of the season. It's go, that Big East conference tournament is going to be on November 29th in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then the Big East final will be on Saturday, November 30th. And whoever wins that conference tournament gets an automatic berth into the NCAA tournament. I think and I think if you win the regular season conference, you also get an automatic berth into the to the NCAA tournament. I I I would like to, I honestly would like to know from you the fans. Do you think all conferences should have a conference tournament or is that just too much on on certain teams? Like a certain require like kind of like in in basketball where there's like a lot where there's like conference tournaments. Should all conferences in volleyball have a have a conference tournament? I would like for you all to know that. You know, hit, hit me up on Twitter at Tan Rodriguez One T E R A N and then Rodriguez R O D R I G U E Z and then the number one. Once again, that's at Tan Rodriguez One. So it, feel free to to reach out to me whether it's in the comment section of this podcast or just hit me up on Twitter and you know tell me if conference tournaments there should be conference tournaments in all of volleyball and all conferences in volleyball, and not just some. So there's that matchup. So we're just going to put that to bed. I can see Creighton all winning that conference, but, you know, Marquette, they barely had to pull it off against Marquette. They can't really do that again against Marquette. You know, you can't really roll the dice and go up 2 nothing. Because when you're up 2 nothing, you basically have to to close the door on them. You base, they're basic, your opponent's on the ground, and you basically need to put their, your foot on their throat. So you basically have to finish the job. Otherwise, they it's not going to look pretty for you. So big ups to Creighton. Big ups to Marquette. I'm sure Marquette will bounce back. You know, Marquette's having a phenomenal season. I think they're one of the more improved teams in the NCAA. So there's that right there. And then finally, finally, last week's noteworthy matchup, number six, or number seven, Wisconsin defended the, their home turf against number six Minnesota, beat sweeping away the Golden Gophers once again. Wisconsin continues to have an amazing season, not just in football. Everyone knows that Wisconsin's football team is the real deal, but they're having a great season in women's volleyball. They definitely deserve the applause button as well. So looking at the box score of the 
of the Wisconsin Minnesota matchup. You know, I was a little surprised to see Wisconsin sweeping away this, to sweeping away of really talented opponents such as Minnesota. Th these two teams, I. I are like are like neighbored rivals, and th this is kind of like a mini rivalry. And Minnesota's gotten the best over the Badgers, but this time it was the Badgers that got the best of the Gophers. So, and Wisconsin is still chilling in first place. This was basically a battle for first place because Wisconsin has toppled some of the superpowers in the Big Ten, such as Penn State and Nebraska. Currently, Wisconsin is definitely mowing through the competition as they they basically they swept through Minnesota and the set score is kind of reflected. It was 25-18, 25-14 and 25-20. Wisconsin definitely took it to Minnesota. Look at the hitting percent. I looked at the hitting percentage of this match, you know, Minnesota really struggled in the first two sets sets hitting only 5 0.50 in the first set and then 0.62 in the second set. They kind of picked it up in the third set, hitting 0.429, but Wisconsin just has a lot of firepower, such as Dana Redkey, who I don't know if I mentioned this last week. She reached 1,000 kills, and she's only a junior, so we definitely got to hit the applause button one more time. I know I'm going crazy with the applause button, but that's all right, honestly. She definitely deserves the applause button. She's only a junior, and there's going to be a lot more kills to come from Miss Dana Redkey. So as for Wisconsin, their hitting percentage, their hitting percentage in the first set was not really all that better. They hit point one, they only hit one fourteen in set one. Then set two, they kind of they cleaned up the hitting errors. They hit point two sixty five, only having four hitting errors. And then in set three, you know Wisconsin hit four sixty two. They had twenty two kills in set in set two, in set three and only four hitting errors. Again, when you have twenty two kills. You're basically doing a lot of good things. You're basically finding the, the spots on the floor, or you're just playing helter-skelter with your opponent, and you're just getting points at will, whether it's off of off of quick hits, quick sets, quick digs, or you're just scrapping to get points. You're getting points. What, what I mean by helter-skelter is that you're getting points that you shouldn't really think that you're getting points off of. But it's definitely impressive that Wisconsin – had such a big game against the Gophers. You know, look at look at the Aces though. The Aces were what really surprised me. Eight to one, Wisconsin dominating the Ace category, and they still had such a big night. And they still had a big night in set three. So Wisconsin definitely getting it done. Blockwise, however, was very surprising. Minnesota had eleven blocks while Wisconsin only had four. So very shocking right there. Digs were nearly were pretty much even. Wisconsin had forty seven digs while. Well, Minnesota kept the ball in play 42 times. Looking at the stat leaders, Wisconsin was led by, you guessed it, Dana Redkey, who had 16 digs, or 16 kills, while Molly Haggerty had 12 digs, and Danielle Hart had 9 kills. Am I saying kills and digs? Ah, well. So, yeah. Once again, Dana Redkey had 16 kills, Molly Haggerty had 12 kills, and then Danielle Hart had 9 kills. Dig-wise, now for the dig-wise... Tiffany Clark had 13 kill or 13 digs. There I go again, mixing up digs and kills. Lauren Barnes had nine digs, and then Izzy Ashburn had nine digs. So Izzy Ashburn's definitely doing getting the job done defensively. I believe she is the the dig leader as well as Tiffany Clark. As for Minnesota, Alexis Hart led the Gophers in kills with 10, while Adana Rollins and Regan Pittman had six kills apiece. Dig-wise, Adana Rollins almost had a... Well, she kind of flirted with a double-double. She had nine digs, while CeCe McGraw had nine digs, and then Rachel Kelly, Kill Kelly had eight digs. So definitely impressive performance by, by Wisconsin. They also got 43 assists from Sydney Hilly, while Bailey McMenamin had 23 assists. So Wisconsin is definitely getting the job done, you know. Wisconsin is proving why they are they're they're no they they are no joke honestly they are not playing any games Wisconsin is not playing any games like they're grounded broken Xbox red ring of death water damage all day air day Wisconsin is not playing games you know they start 
you know, they started off 2-0, and and then Wisconsin dropped their next two matchups, losing to Marquette, who was one of the more improved teams. And then they lost to Baylor, who was currently the number one team. Then they lost back-to-back matches against Washington. And most people kind of wrote off Wisconsin. But then, they, but then Big Ten play started, and then they won six in a row, beating Purdue, then Indiana, then Penn State, then Nebraska. Also have a little bit of a noteworthy win over Northwestern, and even though Northwestern's not that good. And then they also swept Minnesota currently. Friday, you know, you know this. I was gonna go over the some Friday matchups, but you know, I won't have, I won't be able to go over all of the matchups because I'm, I'm a little bit limited today because I'm busy. And then there's also three and out that's gonna be coming on after this. You know, Friday, Wisconsin plays number 18 Illinois, and then Saturday they face Wisconsin w- faces Northwestern again. So. You know, that's a big test right there for Wisconsin. They have to play number 18, Illinois. But they've done a good job at home, honestly. I think they've only lost one home game this year. And that was to... No, they no, no. They've lost two home games, surprisingly. You know, they lost... They lost to Marquette and Baylor. And they also lost to Washington. So, they've had... They've take. So, Wisconsin definitely took their lumps... But they've, they've definitely responded. It will get tougher after this week. Next week, Wisconsin has has, has the Michigan schools being Michigan State and Michigan. That's they're, they're basically going to be going to Michigan, so they better dress warmly. Though, with, though if you're in Wisconsin, you're always dressing warmly. I don't really know about that because what is snow? <laughs> I'm a Cali boy. What could I say? Got to hit the laugh button one more time. But either way, you know, you know, Wisconsin's definitely proving themselves. They 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 can possibly be a good contender, a possible candidate to can to poss to possibly win the Big Ten and have a deep a deep uh, deep NCAA tournament run. And I and I definitely think Wisconsin can do that. You know, I, this could be their year. But they also have they also have the second round of play. They have another matchup against Minnesota in November, and they face Nebraska again. Then they're at Penn State, so there is no conference tournament for there is no conference tournament in the Big Ten. I just think there are too many teams, honestly, and that would be that'd be basically be opening up a can of worms. But that's that's none of our business. So so Wisconsin definitely is doing something is definitely doing their thing. So hopefully, hopefully, we'll be able to see them have a deep run in the NCAA tournament. Though once the NCAA tournament happens, anything can happen. Once the NCAA tournament starts, everyone is 0-0, and and everyone is basically basically vulnerable to an upset. So we'll see how it goes for Wisconsin. But right now, Wisconsin is definitely doing it big. Once again, Dana Redke is doing it big as well. I'll probably go a little bit more in depth on the Big Ten on Saturday. I will have a show on Saturday of Set Point. It'll definitely be longer than maybe less than an hour. Maybe I'll go two hours. Who knows? But honestly, you know that's for another day. So, so that's pretty much it for the for last week's key matchups. There are noteworthy key matchups tonight. The first one being Purdue and Nebraska. We're going to continue to be in the Big Ten. You know, Purdue has definitely had their ups and downs, honestly. But now they have a big, 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 big challenge against Nebraska, honestly. And I honestly I honestly see Nebraska winning that one. I don't really see them... I don't see Nebraska losing. If Nebraska somehow loses this, then they're... I mean, Nebraska is young. I'll say that. Nebraska is young. They did lose a lot of seniors from last year's uh, finals finals team. But honestly, they still have some talented players such as Lexi Sun to name to uh, name one. You know, she's definitely she's definitely a, a force at the net, whether it's offensively or defensively. Lexi Sun is just she she's basically a cheat code. She's like I believe she's like six foot six. I could be wrong. I'm gonna, I'm about to double check, but you know, Lexi Sun, Lexi Sun is basically is basically a cheat code. She's like really tall, and she just gets it done. Like her height makes it so tough to get 
on like defensively, her height makes it so tough to get Pat to get the ball past her on when it comes to her on the block. And then kill wise, it's tough to block her because her because her height is just so because she's just so tall and you can't really like block her and 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 that's that's definitely a recipe for for a nightmare. Oh, she oh Lexi's son's only six two. I she's six two, but she feels like she's like seven feet. So honestly, she's definitely a problem for those that don't that don't really have a an answer for her. Like she definitely has a high vertical, and she definitely does a good job when it comes to serve receiving and when it comes to when it comes to digging. So and she's also an she's. She's an All-American honorable mention from 2017. I definitely think she's she's better than she's definitely better than an All-American honorable mention. I think she she has what it takes to be All-American this year. That's not really my bold prediction, but I definitely can see it happening. It it, it, it probably will happen because you know Nebraska definitely has a lot of youngins on this team currently. Their roster, I think, they have zero seniors. Zero seniors. I cut, I'm going to say that one more time. They have zero seniors. Nebraska has zero seniors, and they are still 13 and 10. People should not be riding off Nebraska. Just because Nebraska has a young team, just because it's mainly full of juniors and sophomores and a few freshmen, does not mean anything. Nebraska is still getting it done. They're still a threat. Don't write them off. They don't have a senior night. Which makes me wonder, if they don't have a senior night this year, what are they going to do in regards to to not having a senior night? Will they just have a fan appreciation night? Will they have a will they have a possible reunion, an alumni night? I don't know. I don't know. What well, that's well, up to Nebraska volleyball. You also need to remember that Nebraska's volleyball coach, John Cook, is a freaking mastermind. He is a genius. He's very smart. Very smart coach. And he has a very good coaching staff. So, and he, he's no stranger when it comes to adversity. So, I, I see you, John Cook. I see you, Nebraska. So, I got Nebraska sweeping Purdue. I actually, yeah, I, I got Nebraska sweeping Purdue tonight. Purdue will have to pull out all the stops in order to beat the corn huskers and, you know playing in an environment such as nebraska is definitely going to be a tough is definitely going to be tough for the boilmakers so we'll see how it goes now we're going to jump into the acc where this matchup louisville at notre dame is going to be a big time matchup because both teams are six and zero in the acc and they're both trying to keep pace with pitt so louisville is definitely one of the more improved teams Considering Louisville, you know, nobody really sees Louisville as a supreme team. You know, Louisville is probably like second, second or third banana to Pitt, which is obviously having a phenomenal year. And then Notre Dame's also up there as well. I think Notre Dame, Notre Dame perennially has a great football team, or not football team. Uh, now I'm getting, now I'm getting three and out on my mind, mixed up with with set point. I can't really do that. But anyway, but Notre Dame always has a great women's volleyball team. They're definitely on the rise this year. You know, whoever wins this definitely will keep pace with Pitt in the ACC rankings. I definitely see Pitt winning that conference just because they're just they're they're just battle tested. You know, they swept Penn State at Penn State, and their only loss is to Penn State at home, which was kind of surprising. But I think Penn State had a big chip on its shoulder after getting swept at Penn State, so. As for this matchup, I got Notre Dame winning this one in four. You know, Notre Dame, you know, they don't really get a whole lot of love just because they're shafted behind behind Pitt, behind Pitt in the ACC. But, you know, I think they can I think they can definitely they can pull this one off, you know. It will yeah, it, and it's going to be at Notre Dame. You know, I'm pretty sure in South Bend playing in South Bend is going to really be beneficial for the Fighting Irish. You know, maybe expect some football players at the game, you know, representing, considering... Notre Dame has some really passionate fans. So I think Notre Dame gets this done in four. But I expect the the Cardinals, the Louisville Cardinals, to just 
just show up and show some fight. I will say this, you know, next, you know, next week Notre Dame does play Pitt at home. So if I'm, so if I'm Notre Dame, I don't look ahead to that week because they also played Virginia Tech on Friday. So they got to get Louisville out of the way. Then they also have to get Virginia Tech out of the way. So there's the, the, there's that. But I think I got. Notre Dame winning that one and four. I think they're just a little bit. I think they're just a little have a little bit more of a cut above Louisville, and you know, you know. But who? But honestly, that's basically a pick'em game right there. But I got Notre Dame winning that one. I believe Notre Dame and Louisville have the same overall records as well, and I and I do believe, and I am one hundred percent certain that's true, considering considering I am pulling up the NCAA. NCAA app, NCAA app, yep, yep, that is definitely true. Louisville and Notre Dame do have the same records. However, consider this: Notre Dame is not ranked, while Louisville is ranked. So that's definitely a little bit of a surprise. I'm, look, I'm double checking, and yeah, Notre Dame is not on here. N- Notre Dame is; they are receiving votes, but you know, Notre Dame is not ranked. So. So Louisville's kind of got a lot to prove. They are definitely one of the more improved teams. Notre Dame's Notre Dame's kind of been up there as well. They've kind of been up and down in years past, but you know, I'm I'm taking I'm taking Notre Dame in the upset in four. I think they get it done in South Bend. You know, you know, I, I'm I'm certain they they can. If, if and you know, also I also kind of hope it goes five. I also hope it goes five. You know, maybe it'll go five. So who knows? So who knows? Who knows? But I got Notre Dame winning in four. That that's not well, but then again, but again, that's not my bold prediction. My bold prediction will be coming up soon. So so as so as for where I'll be, I this weekend I'm actually going to be at two women's volleyball matches. On Friday, I'm going to be at Long Beach State against Cal State Fullerton. And then Saturday, I'm going to be at Long Beach State against UC Irvine in the in the black in the blue and gold rivalry so, and or the black and blue rivalry either way it's a rivalry game between UC Irvine and Long Beach State it's also kind of a rivalry game between Fullerton and and Long Beach State as well so i'm definitely going to be there expect some if you're following me on twitter expect some like video clips and maybe i'll post on youtube i'll definitely be tagging i sports radio and larry b in some of these videos considering you know, I, I I want at my work, I want my work to be shared with everyone. So yeah, so so yeah, I'm gonna be and to talk about the Big West Conference from from last week. You know, it was a crazy week. You know, there was the big matchup of the week being being Hawaii at UC at Cal Poly and then Hawaii at UCSB. So Hawaii. Or no, Cal Poly swept away Hawaii, which was kind of a surprise. I thought Hawaii was going to put up a better fight than that, but Cal Poly does have the longest winning streak in the na- home winning streak in the nation. I believe it's now at 27, if not 28. I'll double check that via Cal Poly's uh, athletic website. But once again, but once again, that's a def- that's definitely a huge win for for Cal Poly because it keeps Cal Poly in the in first place in in, in the Big West, in the Big West Conference, right there, and I definitely think, Cal, and Cal Poly has been for real, you know. You know, Cal Poly is definitely the real deal. You know, Cal Poly only had one game last week, and but it was and it was against Hawaii, but you know they're they're definitely they're definitely still getting it done in the Big West Conference. Believe it or not, Cal Poly started off. 0-3, which was a very big surprise. And many people kind of wrote off the Mustangs. Then they won three in a row. Then they lost to Pitt. Then they won two in a row. Then they lost to Colorado State. And now they've pretty much won. They have won eight in a row. And again, they still hold. And this was basically a whiteout. And this and Friday's sweep over. Hawaii for Cal Poly was the first ever sweep over Hawaii, which was a he- which was definitely huge because it goes to show you how far Cal Poly's come. And Hawaii has dominated the Big West Conference from years past. This time, 
but now but now Cal Poly is taking charge and they're definitely definitely proving why they're still the reigning Big West Conference champs. Gotta hit the applause button for Cal Poly. So yeah, so yeah, ju- so yeah. Just to confirm, Cal Poly's home winning streak is the longest in the nation, and it's at 28 consecutive home wins. So, so that that's definitely a huge that's definitely huge for the Mustangs. And you know that that's a that's a really good sweep for Cal Poly beating a ranked Hawaii team. And you know, and and, uh, and like I said, Hawaii was definitely going to get forced out of their comfort zone. And look at the stats. For Cal Poly, Maya Dvoracek had 16 kills. She's based in, uh, and had a hitting percentage of 3.23. You know, Meredith Phillips had eight kills with a 4.29 hitting percentage. She de- they definitely the Mustangs definitely did their their damage offensively. They had a three three eleven hitting percentage on the on the match. You know, they out aced. The, Hawaii seven to four it was quite, kind of surprising because Hawaii definitely serves the ball well. Hint hint, really good, really good player that serves well on Hawaii. They also Cal Poly also outdug Hawaii fifty one to forty, which was definitely big right there. And they outblocked Hawaii six to five, which isn't that big, you know. And then they only had thirteen hitting errors on the night. Hawaii hit one fifty, which was kind of surprising. You know, Hawaii is a much better team when it comes to hitting than that. You know, they had set they they had half of they had a, a seventeen they had thirty four kills and then seventeen hitting errors, which is kind of surprising. So so they had half half of their hitting errors were also kill were basically kills. Well, no, they had. They had uh, double. They had double the kills of. Basically, what I'm trying to say is, they had 17 hitting errors, and then they had double that in terms of kills. So, so that, that's again, it's a little surprising to see Hawaii drop that one because I thought Hawaii would have at least gone four, maybe five. The set scores were pretty close, however. First set, Cal Poly won that first set, 25-22. Second set, the, those the two teams had to grind it out, and then Cal Poly just snuck it out in the end. And then that winning that close second set gave Cal Poly all the momentum going forward because they sucked the energy out of Hawaii as Cal Poly just ran past Hawaii in the third set, 25-15. Second set was 26-24, if I didn't mention. But that was definitely a huge, huge momentum break. Momentum giver for Cal Poly. You know, this just goes to show you that Hawaii needs to will need to be will need to work a little bit harder because now they've got two conference losses. They, like I said, they lost to UC Irvine, which was definitely an unexpected loss. You know, Hawaii is definitely a better team than that, and you know, this just goes to show you that if you're not playing your best ball in conference, you know, you could be on the wrong end of the of the score, and more importantly, you know. The conference games are what matter the most, and the Big West Conference not being a Power Five conference like the Pac-12 or the Big Ten, they only have like one or two teams going to the NCAA tournament. There is no Big West Conference tournament like there is in basketball or soccer. I really think they should probably they should probably change that. But but that but 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 but, but, but that's for another day. That that's a debate for another day, honestly. Um, but yeah, Cal Poly still in first place as their next matchup is going to be on, I believe Friday against, against UC Santa Barbara. And speaking of UC, or no Saturday, this Saturday, Cal Poly plays UC Santa Barbara, which is also receiving votes. Um, speaking of UC Santa Barbara, they also played Hawaii at the Thunderdome being UC Santa Barbara. So, and Hawaii, after coming off of a tough loss, they managed to pull off the victory against, against the Gauchos. The Rainbow Warriors pulled out the victory against the Gauchos, sweeping the Gauchos at the Thunderdome. I believe that's, that's, uh, UCSB's, uh, first loss 
home loss of the year, which is kind of surprising. You know, Hawaii, uh, you got to give props to Hawaii, though. You know, coming off of a very tough loss, they could have just kept their heads down. They could have sulked about the loss, but they kept... They kept grinding it out, and eventually they got back on track. And I even said this on Twitter. It goes to show you that Hawaii still has a little bit of fight left in them, despite despite losing a big game like despite losing a game like that. So honestly, you gotta give it up to Hawaii. But this just also goes to show you that UCSB is gonna need to work a lot harder if they want to win the conference championship. Sure, they've got some noteworthy wins against like UC UCLA, Pepperdine, or yeah, Pepperdine. They played Colorado close, but they don't. But consider this: Santa Barbara doesn't really have a stand, a breakout victory. I mean, yes, they have that one victory over San Diego, but where? But who else do they really have? I mean, I don't really see too many standout wins. And they also had to go five with CSUN. So it just goes to show you that. This Saturday's game between Cal Poly and UCSB is going to be a crucial game between both teams. Both teams will de- – whoever wins will basically – if Cal Poly wins, they will basically be two legs up on Hawaii and UCSB in terms of the Big West Conference lead. If UCSB wins or Santa Barbara wins, then UCSB or Santa Barbara is basically jumped back into the – the Big West Conference race, and it'll be a complete logjam for first place between Pauly and Santa Barbara. And then Hawaii's still in the mix as well, and many people tend to forget that Hawaii has, gets to play Santa Barbara and Pauly at Hawaii, and that's, and you know, Hawaii and, and uh, Santa Barbara is going to be forced, no, no, Pauly and Santa Barbara are definitely going to be forced out of their comfort zone against Hawaii, so that's going to be huge right there, but that's not until later. Cal Poly needs to get past Santa Barbara. It, they're going to be forced a little out of their comfort zone against the Gauchos, but, you know, I, I, I kind of have Ca- Poly winning that one. As much as I'm a believer of the Gauchos, I definitely think Poly can win this one. I think Poly's a little bit more disciplined. They took their lumps early in the season. Like I said, they start 0-3, but now they've won... They've won 13 out of their last 15, which is definitely impressive. Santa Barbara's definitely going to need to work hard against against the the Mustangs. You know, it just it can't be the Lindsey Runs show. Lindsey Runs had 12 kills against Hawaii. I, I would have thought she ha- would have had more, but you know, Hawaii definitely did a good job against her. Gigi Runs, Lindsey's younger sister had seven kills you know good to see the run sisters going leading the the charge for the gauchos but uh, looking at looking at the the box score from the hawaii ucsb game you know it, it's a little surprising because hawaii didn't outblock ucsb or santa barbara outblocked hawaii seven to five dig wise it was pretty tight so something must have been up with a uh, with Santa Barbara that night. And the hitting errors weren't that high as well. So, you know, Santa Barbara did hit 175 as opposed to Hawaii's 286. And they did out ace them 6-4. to four. So, so statistically, for the most part, Santa Barbara won most of the statistic categories other than the hitting percentage and, and digs. But, you know, but Hawaii, on the other hand, Hawaii coming off of a tough loss just had a lot more had a lot more to, to lose. Like they had a lot more to lose as opposed to Santa Barbara did. Cause if Hawaii did lose that match to Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara is still in first place with Cal Poly. And then Hawaii is three games back of the Gauchos and the Mustangs. And that's really what, where you don't want to be if you're Hawaii, but Hawaii's turned it around. You know, they're definitely an impressive program. You know, they only have, the Rainbow Warriors or Rainbow Wahine have three losses on the season: one to Irvine, one one to Pauly, and one to to Baylor, which is obviously the number one team in the nation. But you know, Hawaii's Hawaii's definitely an under the radar team. You know, I think Hawaii's got a little bit of a a little bit of a lighter a little bit of a breather this week. So Hawaii's definitely going to get back on track. 
and start another winning streak and they just and then eventually they're definitely going to need to work really hard in order to possibly get that that uh big west conference championship and perhaps make a deep run to the ncaa tournament oh and a big shout out to noreen ayazia who surpassed 1000 digs in her in her uh in her college career. So that's definitely huge for her. She's a setter an outside hitter. And she also can play libero too. So she definitely does it all. She's definitely, she's definitely got the Madden number. So I definitely got to hit the applause button for Noreen Ayazia. And on the topic of shoutouts, I would like to get, wish a happy birthday to Catherine Plummer of Stanford. She, if you don't know who she is, she is definitely one of the more dominant players in in the nation. She's been named Player of the Year, I believe, two times. And she also was named Freshman of the Year back her freshman year at Stanford. She is definitely continuing her dominance. She is out for a little bit, but you know she's, she's hopefully going to get back onto the court soon. Someone who has stepped up in her place is definitely been Kendall Kipp, who is only a freshman, and she was named Pac-12 Freshman of the Week. And for those of you that don't know, Kendall Kipp came from Southern California, and she definitely has she definitely has the goods. She's definitely done well this year. I believe she's been named Pac-12 Pac Freshman of the Week three times this season. And honestly, this is now this is my bold prediction. This is kind of a part one and part two. I predict Kendall Kipp will be the Pac-12 Freshman of the Year this year. And I also predict, this is the bold prediction right here. I predict Kendall Kipp will be the National Freshman of the Year. I'm calling it right now. Kendall Kipp is the National Freshman of the Year and the Pac-12 Freshman of the Year. The bold, bold prediction is basically the National Freshman of the Year. Because I definitely think Kendall Kipp has what it takes. Offensively, she's definitely a... A plus four for Stanford with Kendall with uh, Catherine Plummer out. Kip just has long arms and she's six foot five, so she's not easy to block. And her block at the net is very intimidating. You know, not a whole lot of teams can get past her. She's kind of like Lexi Sun, except a lot more taller. So Kendall Kip has definitely been one of the standout freshmen this year. You know, many people kind of predicted she would be. You know, she. She's definitely fitting well and meshing well with Jenna Gray, who is the setter of of Stanford. Stanford, and she's also becoming a crowd favorite. So, you know, she's definitely got the Madden numbers, and she's definitely she's definitely becoming a key contributor. So, once again, my National Freshman of the Year prediction will probably be is definitely Kendall Kip. And I also expect her to win Pac-12 Freshman of the Year. You know, she's definitely on a roll, and she's definitely, she's definitely like, she has no intention of slowing down again for Stanford. And even when when Catherine Plummer gets back, I can still see, see her in the rotation. You know, maybe they'll put her, maybe they'll still put her on outside. Maybe she'll split time with Megan McClure, who's also another Southern California product from Orange County. You know, who knows? You know. I think Kendall Kipple is definitely going to grow on everyone at Stanford, and she's also just going to continue to to get her way, and not a whole lot of teams are going to have an answer for her. So we'll see how it goes, though, but Kendall Kipp is definitely doing it big. And, you know, once again, I predict her to be National Freshman of the Year. And with that, and with that bold prediction, that about wraps it up. I will be joining each and every one of you this Saturday for another edition of set point once again this is your boy taren rodriguez and as larry b once said cue the music so once again have an amazing day enjoy some volleyball and if you see me at the pyramid definitely give me a shout out give give me a what's up or do just just say hi to me that would make my day but once again have a great day enjoy some volleyball and as always Keep on spiking it.